Hello, 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 you guys. This is your girl, Nashville. Welcome back to my channel. I'm so glad you're here. Um, so, today I want to talk about... We know that Meghan Markle has been vilified by the UK media. We know that she has faced huge amounts of racism and microaggressions through the UK media. And we know that there is a targeted hate campaign towards her. You know, constant coverage towards this one woman for years, okay? There, there's no question of the absurdity of it. Which got me to thinking, taking this off, which got me to thinking, um, what practically can be done about this? What practically can be done to transform the UK media so that it is less biased, less prejudiced, and more ethical? Because at the end of the day, when you looked at the Harry and Meghan documentary, you know, um, before it came out, people thought that Harry and Meghan were going to go and trash the royal family. But truly, what they really did was exposed how corrupt, how problematic the UK media is. Now, being American, the US media is by no means perfect. I'm so sorry, my eye is just like leaking today. I need to take an antihistamine. Um... By no means is the U.S. media perfect, but I do think in several terms of speaking in terms of systemic prejudice, white supremacy, addressing white supremacy head on, and trying to restore more equality, more equity, I think that the U.S. is in a further place because its history is different, A, from the U.K., but it is, you know, it's born of the U.K., so there are some similar roots. Um, but I just think in terms of these progressive modern conversations about the ethics of our media, um, social media, social constructs, race relations, equality, social justice, you know, conversations about race and being biracial, I just feel like the U.S. is a little bit further um, because there's been an intentional con concentration on this, whereas I feel like the stiff British upper lip really is about not talking about things in public that really are going to stir the waters. And what that opens up is some difficulty. So this is not by any means me trying to, you know, tell the UK what it should do or anything. Like all things on this channel, this is just a discussion amongst like-minded people about global issues, especially concerning women, concerning black and brown peoples, those marginalized peoples who, unless they're grassroots movements like this, like the Sussex Squad movement, like the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, like the Free Britney movement, for example, um, just to even take race out of it, unless there are these grassroots movements sometimes, which... You know me, I, at the end of the day, policy and lawmaking is where I feel like the real change happens. And we're going to talk about that today. But grassroots movements also really help to boost. I feel like grassroots movements, they really work, work as like this um, equalizer. You know, they just, they kind of push and propel it forward. And if these don't happen for those causes supporting, um, you know, the, the dismantle of systemic prejudice, systemic racism, systemic misogyny, um, those types of issues, nothing will happen. You know why? Sadly, it's because society is extremely complicit. And, you know, I don't, I, don't shoot the messenger. I'm just the messenger. Um, there is a lovely Bob Marley quote um, where he talks basically about that whole idea of not shooting the messenger. So... That's basically what we're going to talk about today, guys. I, I have been so compelled by this story of Meghan Markle, and I think many people everywhere, not just black and brown people, but even women who have experienced um, being gaslit, being persecuted, and being made to feel bad about that persecution, um, really connected with Meghan Markle's story and how the media has handled this in a completely unethical way. But not just the media, primarily the British media. We know that she's American, we know that she married into the British royal family, which is a certain level of affluence and influence, a certain level of power, and many people, whether they admit it conscious or subconscious, did not think that this biracial American commoner 
merited that position of power. And um, the media totally fueled those flames in a completely unethical way. A, a way in which any, any sort of journalist who calls themselves a real journalist, whether that be an individual or the entire entity, what has been done to Meghan Markle and the UK media is not ethical and it needs to be addressed. This is a global issue. At this point, this is a global issue. Um, so yeah, this is not me trying to um, stick my nose in where it doesn't mind, uh, where it doesn't belong. Uh, it's really just me talking about uh, a subject matter that I really care about, and I think that a lot of people really care about, and that affects conversations all over the world, especially for women especially for people of color. Um, so that's why I think that we need to have these conversations about the UK media possibly transforming. Um, having lived there six months, being American, and you know, like I said, the US having its history, its revolution a long time ago to separate from England, but still um, having those roots, um, I think that this is a really proper space to talk about because the United States has gone about its own sort of um, periods of media reform in the past as well. And I think it's just maybe time that, um, you know, people around the world, constituents around the world, global constituents in the U.S., in France, you know, Germany, whatever it might be, just lend a, a helping hand and a listening ear to the U.K. because I really think they, they need it at this point and they need a perspective outside of the propaganda, you know. So that's what this really is about today. Um, a few updates before we get into it. So basically, I've got pulled up here about six or seven sources that we're going to look at. And we're going to, I mean, this is this is not uh, a video just speculating about the abuse that Meghan Markle received. It's talking about real instances in the media that were just totally out of line. Um, and then it's a look at the practical information of what can be done um, in real political ways to change the policies that allow these these media companies to just do whatever it is that they want to do. Um, so we'll get into that in just one second before we do a little bit of housekeeping, a uh, little bit of updates. Um, so first of all, I am so sorry. I have not been as engaged as I want to be haven't been responding to comments very quickly. I haven't been uh, putting out as much content as much as I would like to. There's so many projects that are just backed up. So I'm just going to talk to you about that. Um, yesterday, my husband and I had a little dinner party with um, a friend and his girlfriend from grad school. And uh, it was absolutely lovely. And I... <laughs> We sort of made this, you know, since we have French people in the house, Portuguese people in the house, American people, um, I made a big old American spread, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, my friend's girlfriend, she's, she's tiny little thing and she, she's like, oh my God, these are the portions you guys normally have in America. And I'm like, oh yeah. And of course, Portuguese people are the same. Portuguese people have big old portions as well. <laughs> And uh, I was just telling her, yeah, you know, when I went, when I met my husband, it was like American meta Portuguese. We were like, oh, your family makes huge portions of meals. Yours does too. Oh, cool. You know, it's like <laughs> love at first sight. But now I'm just joking. Um, so we had that. I made fried chicken, and I made the like church's chicken style fried chicken. I'm talking like with the cornstarch, and well, actually, I use potato starch instead of cornstarch, but with uh, flour and paprika and lots of cumin and um, cayenne pepper and it was really really good um, you know just that crunchy and oily and flaky at the same time and uh, I just I told her this is literally like a meal my mom would make you my grandma would make you steamed carrots steamed vegetables mashed potatoes uh, some some white gravy uh, that had a pork base with a lot of pepper, you know, and um, basil in it. So that was the American portion. So for the Portuguese portion was our dessert. We had nata, natas, and it's basically like this custard pie. Just go and look it up, N-A-T-A. -A. Oh, 
so good. But it's basically like a little miniature custard pie. And it's got this little like, you know, at the top when it's kind of cooked almost to a caramelized point. So good. And the French portion of the dinner was the wine. <laughs> oh gosh. Anyway, so we had a we had a ball last night and just listened to some good music and Oh my lord, I feel like I was cleaning my house though for like forever and Jesus. But that was really good. I've been really busy with work. I've been really busy with my catechism and Bible study stuff. Um, so that's just me saying I'm sorry I've been busy, but you know I'm here. When you see your con you send your comments through, I might not respond immediately, but I know that they're there and I'm so happy for it. Um, what else? I want to give an update to Sussex Squad on Dr. Shola. So, guys, I don't know what is going on, and, I, and frankly, I'm a little bit disappointed. I have been buzzing, like, periodically, like, frequently, Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter UK, um, United Nations, um, who else? NAACP. I have been constantly emailing them constantly tweeting them and I don't get back one single response so that just that's the kind of stuff that like just encourages me even more to keep shouting it out so but I also invite you guys to shout out about Dr. Shola to those different organizations and just say hey this woman received a letter from a white supremacist group you know could you cover it could you talk about it on your social media could you express some awareness about it could you contact her could you do some sort of special with her so um, I'm still keeping my faith and I'm going in hard with that because that's, yeah, that shouldn't just pass by lightly. And from what I see with the Met Police and the UK, just, it's very different from the US. I'm always so, you know, it was like when I stayed in the UK. Um, I was actually talking to someone in my catechism group. He's French, she's older. And, um, we were talking, he was like, why did you choose France? Why did you choose Paris over London? And I was like, oh, I stayed in London for six months and... I just, you know, there's that quote that says, you know, British people and American people are separated by a common language. It, and I, it felt like that, you know, like this warmth that I got from Parisians, which they're not like Americans. Like if we're looking at this on like a spectrum, you know, this is like warm. This is like hot over here. And this is like cold over here. It's like, uh, Americans are right here. French people are right here. And British people are over here. So it's just like, you know that very guarded sort of reserved thing um I just felt like I really couldn't break through to anyone and so it just at the end of the day it just wasn't a cultural fit but at the same time I had a lot of experiences there that were really cultivating you know as far as like art and literature and going and looking at different monuments and things like that like that was more of an introspective practice but and I, I engaged with some people who were curious about that and that was a level of connection but on just like a baser social level, um, I have more of a connection with French people. And um, yeah, it's like that. And so that's, that's, yeah, I feel like when we look at this stuff with Meghan Markle, we see all that. We see that. We see that from the very beginning. Um, there was going to be <laughs> some difficulty here because you're taking a liberal American a mixed race woman and plopping her into a culture that does basically everything it can to just not make a fuss. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that, that was probably always going to be very difficult. And, um, what else? So very soon I'm also going to be doing another video, Meghan Markle's story has inspired me to do a video about how to handle microaggressions and this is really more geared towards people of color you know black people brown people asian people you know middle eastern people muslims you know muslims and um 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 you know people who are part of minority or marginalized groups because often those those are the people who receive microaggressions whether those microaggressions are related to sexism to racism to xenophobia um yeah like it's it i, I feel like covid-19 and uh, a flux of a sort of 
um, very polarized political climate basically in the past few years has fueled a lot of microaggressions and um, at the end of the day I think that you know it's just like um, I can't remember who said it but they basically said um, someone really smart probably smarter than me said that um, oh I think it was Barack Obama yes yes because I'm, I'm listening to his audiobook it was definitely Barack Obama Barack Obama, I'm loosely quoting this, he basically said, you know, uh, what did he say? He said, good and bad, you know, life is basically accepting that good and bad could be beautifully and intricately, you know, interweaved and tangled in the same body. And that's basically where you're at, you know. And people right now who are really polarized, who just seem to be, uh, being bigoted, being negative, sending microaggressions your way. I feel like we really have to take the stance of what would Jesus do. We have to look at these people as really working from their places of fear and not necessarily just being crazy sociopaths out to get you. You know, which a lot of them are crazy sociopaths out to get you, right? But um, some of them, they're just um, they're operating from fear. They have a fear of something and that's a very human attribute. So what's important is for us to have these conversations. You know, we can't advance anywhere unless we have these conversations. So, um, I'm going to have that video about microaggressions coming to you really, really soon. I think it's very important to talk about. It makes me, um, you know, I was talking to my husband yesterday who is European and so I think that's another reason why this whole debacle with Megan really affects me because having been married into a white family, being black myself, and also having experienced a lot of tokenism in my life, thankfully I've never experienced anything like being called the N-word by someone, you know, but I'm still pretty young, so <laughs> we'll see. But, you know, it's I've never experienced that overt type of racism. But I have definitely experienced microaggressions, definitely, definitely, definitely. And I've even experienced it from people close to me. That, that's why I'm saying, like, I think we really need to come from a place of trying to remove the emotion from it a little bit and figure out how we can get along best. That comes from across the spectrum. You know, everybody on the black end, on the white end, Hispanic, Asian, you know, Middle Eastern, whatever. You know, we all basically, these conversations around how to get along, when you're living in a multicultural, multiracial world, multi-religious world, multi-faith world, um, these conversations are not comfortable really for anyone. You know, nobody really wants to be having these conversations, but they're necessary. And it's necessary to basically remain respectful. And um, I was thinking on this, making this video for the content with the microaggressions the other day. And I was thinking about the fact that um, two particular instances, you know, and one of them is actually someone who was close to me they're no longer close to me but um one was i was on the train and it was uh, i was coming home from the office i was working in paris i think at this point and then it had been a long day and my best friend facetimed me and i picked up the call now let me just give you this little snippet paris trains are loud af like it is loud everybody's just gabbing 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 talking sometimes even at like seven o'clock in the morning people are just like talking away you, you hear people playing music there's people walking throughout the cha uh, train playing you know the xylophone or the guitar or whatever asking for money it's always very loud so my best friend called me on facetime and i was genuinely making a very concerted effort not to be too loud right and so this woman that was sitting next to me, which who the woman I noticed had put out a microaggression even before she, before she even opened her mouth to me. The moment I sat down, she sort of just did that, <clears throat> you know. Yeah, she started that microaggression from the beginning. Like, even when I just came to sit down, she just sort of did that shuffle, like, <clears throat> and then that side eye that just basically made it seem like I was an inconvenience for her, even just sitting down. And, um... When I started my conversation, she told me, you don't belong here, <laughs> which I don't know what that even means. I don't know if that means from that gross xenoph xenophobic place, like me being American in, in France, you know, like saying I don't belong here, 
or if that meant I don't belong in this train. I have no idea. And she was probably in her 70s. She had short hair. Uh, it was black, but it was likely dyed. Well, it was probably dark brown. And she had on, you know, nice clothes, whatever it is. And she went looking for the train police, I guess, to sort of tell on me. And, of course, just like I knew she would, she came back in a second. Um, and I said, oh, okay, so you're racist. Oh, okay, so you're racist. I'm not racist. I'm not racist. Then why are you talking to me like this? Oh, okay, because you're racist. So at that point, that's when she had got up to go find the train uh, security or whatever. And then she comes walking back again, looking really disappointed to find another seat because I guess at this point she's too embarrassed of herself to sit back down where she was perfectly fine. At this point, I had already basically ended my conversation. It took all of, what, five minutes. And, um, yeah, I guess she didn't find that security. And everybody's just looking at her like she's crazy. But I, I think that, and then the other instance I thought about, so... You know, something I told my husband yesterday, you know, this idea of the angry black woman has really been a stereotype that's just been stuck on us in order to invalidate us. And I have found often, many, many times, you know, even my own husband, this is just to illustrate the point that this is something deeply culturally ingrained, where Europeans think that I'm being aggressive and I'm just being me. I'm like, what? I, I'm missing something, you know, and, and even generally looking at my, my family, my friend, my community system, my community circle that's made up of black people, those black individuals from my circle growing up until the point of where I'm an adult, I'm an adult now, um, most of the, the black people consider me to be very respectful because it's something that I was raised to have and that I really, really pride myself on. And I literally have to just hold my breath sometimes to not say something disrespectful because it does matter that much to me. So, you know, amongst my black circles, my black and brown circles, and my woke white friends who are usually younger, sorry to put it that way, um, because I do think that age comes into this too. Amongst those people, you know, my woke white friends, and I don't even like, like, you know, I don't like to speak in white and black, but when you talk about a conversation about microaggressions, about um, media reform, so it's less racist, you have to talk about race, but, you know, um, among former teachers, former professors, amongst um, colleagues, friends, people who are black, brown, and woke white people, I'm respectful, I'm humble, I'm kind, uh, people describe me as really bubbly, okay? But amongst often European people, I still get that uh, aggressive thing stuck on my forehead. Like I'm just aggressive. So it's often where black women in, in history, historically, you know, just being as opinionated, as independent, as, you know, normal of a person going through your day experiencing the different parts of your day as normal as any other person just as a white woman just as anyone else black women historically has still have still gotten that label of aggressive aggressive but angry black woman stereotype towards them so um i'm gonna make a video on that because i found a bunch of amazing quotes from people um on microaggressions and, and not taking your critics too seriously. And I think at the end of the day, that's what that comes down to. It's basically you having to not take your critics too seriously. I found this one amazing article, and I, I'm speaking from my perspective as a black woman, but I feel like anyone who's faced microaggressions, and we know that that can be any woman, you know, because sexism, there's lots of microaggressive sexist sort of things that come out. Uh, of people's mouths, just, or even gestures, a black men, of course, anyone brown, anyone of a different religion other than Christianity, plenty of people experience microaggressions, so I felt like this would be a great video to put out just for a motivational thing, so I want you guys to watch out for that, but I found some amazing, amazing quotes on, um, you know, taking in what the critics say, but continuing on on your mission, despite other people's 
insecurities, jealousies, lack of happiness, whatever that might be, because oftentimes we know that that's where that aggression, that uh, that microaggression comes from. Um, I'm going to talk about Karens at some point. I've also done a little bit of psychology and research to Karens because I don't want to look at people and just immediately go, oh, you're stupid, you're racist, you're idiot, whatever. I really want to know what's going on. Even that woman on the train the day, that day, if I could have just ca caught her outside of the train, I would have said, oh, you B-I-T-C. I would have said, how you doing? How, how's your day going? I'm sorry if I disturbed you. Is everything okay? You know, that's that's the type of person that I am. Um, but anywho, so uh, there's some great quotes in there from um, Mark Twain, from Barack Obama, from Oprah Winfrey, um, from who else did I put? Winston Churchill, Ralph Waldo Emerson, my favorite writer. Um, but, you know, it's, it's all going to come up to the same thing, basically, at the end of the day. Oh, and it also talks about Southern black women. I found this article, this amazing article about why Southern black women and Southern black people, period, basically grew up with systemic racism as a part of their DNA. And so it doesn't even really surprise them. And they've got this tough shell, this armor. And it's so true. Like, it really does not phase me. Like, the comments that might fly onto my page that are clearly coming from microaggression or racist or xenophobic type place, it really doesn't phase me. I look at it as something that means that I'm doing something right, you know, because, like I said, if we don't speak about these things, nothing can be done about them. Guys, the live stream is coming, so basically where I'm at right now is I am finalizing all of my research materials, finalizing the presentation, which I think you guys are going to like, and just kind of formulating the the kind of um, timeline of the chat to make sure that we kind of don't take up too much time and all of that stuff. Um, so yeah, my goal is by the end of the week to have you guys have, you know, the little upcoming reminder. So when you type in Suck the Squad, you should be able to see a little reminder. If you keep scrolling down, you'll see the calendar m reminder of when the live stream will happen. So, <sighs> get me to the end of the week. Uh, I'm really excited about it, so just please stay a little bit more patient with me. Um, and like I said, um, in a decision to just really not, um, how do I want to say, to really not um, encroach on any of the other Sexy Squad channels, because I don't want to. There's so many good ones out there. I don't want to sort of detract away from any of the other ones or um, encroach on their time, you know, the actual time that they are on. So these are probably going to be like once a month. Um, if I can squeeze two in, I really will try. But let, I think let's do a little sexy squad chat room like once a month. Um, so yeah, I think that's all the updates I have for now. So with that being said, let's get right into this. So, um, this first thing that I have is actually, um, a scientific study. Um, it takes a scientific approach to the study of, uh, the, the, the way that Meghan Markle has been approached in the media. Now, I'm not going to go through this whole thing. I basically just wanted to pull out the instances from this article that show when the media just was really out of line with Meghan Markle. So the article is from the Atlantis Press. Um, I won't go through the whole thing, but like I said, it's written by Magafira Fitrunar Ardifa and Harumu Manik Ayu Yemen. Uh, and these are both, uh, I think these are both faculty members of the University of Indonesia. And so this is called The Construction of Meghan Markle's Identity as a Biracial Woman in Media Reports. It's not a long read. I will link all of the sources in the bio. Um, but I, I really, really, I dug what they were saying. And I really thought that it was well thought out. And it definitely had basis in truth. So just some of the instances. I'm not going to, like I said, I'm not going to read the article. But I'm just going to read some of the snippets. Because they have um, exhibits in here where they show where... Um, the the UK media was racist or xenophobic towards Meghan Markle and many times it does have that air of microaggression where it's not overtly overtly racist but you know that it's not right so the first one is from time and it says Meghan Markle can make the royal family more modern 
and they put modern in quotation marks. Now this is one of the ones that's not overtly racist and it's not really racist at all, but it is othering. It lets us know that Meghan Markle is not being welcomed into the royal family just based on her own merits or whatever and that they're not really making a big deal out of it. They're just like, hey, this is awesome. She's here. We're, 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 we're happy about it. Let's go. It's more like, you know, we have to talk about her race. It's like, even with time, which is a little bit more progressive, it's like we have to talk about it. So anyway, the next one is from The Sun. And that one from the time was 2018. Not, t not t the Times, but Time magazine. This one is from The Sun from 2018. It says, Meghan's presence in the royal family does not really modernize royals, does not really modernize the royals because she could alienate the royalists, you know? So that right there is overtly not right, okay? That's racist. It's othering. I mean, it's always othering. The next one is from the Daily Express. This is 2018. It says, quote, the Queen's decision to allow Prince Harry to, Meg to marry Meghan Markle shows how she is set on modernizing the royals. And that also gives this, you know, it, it just that right there. It's <laughs> let's decontract this. OK, because there's many nuanced levels of this. And a lot of times people say, unless somebody is calling you a slur word, you know, an N word, it's not racist, but you don't really understand that there is undertones of this that make it seem bigoted. So let's read this again. The Queen's decision to allow Prince Harry, the Queen's decision to allow Prince Harry to marry Meghan Markle shows how she is set on modernizing the royal family. It's just, uh, yeah, okay. So moving on to the next one, the Washington Post. It's not modern to have a, mi a black or mixed race person in the royal family or aristocratic society. If Britain and its royal family truly wants to be modern, it's time that the United Kingdom as a nation fully acknowledges its past with black and brown people. Again, that's from the Washington Post, a U.S. media outlet. And the first one was also from a U.S. media outlet. The two in between were from the Sun and the Daily Express. So you also can see how that nuanced language is different from U.S. from the U.K. And then you have Daily Mail, um, which the prince is going to marry somebody straight out of Compton. They pull that quote. Um, that, that, that's definitely an example of overt racism just wrong in so many ways and then they pull a quote from glamour 2018 these are all 2018 so i'm getting the impression that this this was written in 2018 but we know that Meghan markle has received non-stop media coverage often interweave with all of this microaggressive type stuff racist type stuff for like seven years now it's insane i've never seen anything like it in my life so Glamour in 2018 said, Meghan Markle is an American woman, a daughter to a black mother and a white father, and a descendant of those enslaved and those who were always free. So that was Glamour. I, I don't know how I feel about that. I don't know how I feel about that. I mean, it's true. I just don't know about the approach. It just seems a little bit crass. You know, now, like, this could also come, I mean, I'm also a writer at heart. My dad was a writer, so this can also come to taste when it comes to writing. But if it was a little bit something more poetic, something with thought given to it, where they said, you know, for example, there's something absolutely beautiful and poetic towards all of our ancestors. The fact that a woman of those who might have been enslaved and a woman of those who were free is now married into the royal family. If it was said or reconstructed in a way like that, you would get the fact that these people are excited about it. But the way that it's said here, it sounds... Okay. Then you have the son, 2018. It says, her mother is black with dreadlocks. The son. Her mother is black with dreadlocks, and she passes as Caucasian. 
And and that right there is directly where that's coming from, where you people where you hear people coming in comments on YouTube on Reddit all the time saying, She's whiter than me, you know? It's like that that's irrelevant. And if you don't understand that, that that's irrelevant, you know, I think you really need to open your em empathy meter up. And I think that you need to talk to peoples of different walks of life in your life. It sounds like you're living in a wind tunnel. And she passes as Caucasian. She often received hurtful comments about whether Doria was her real mom. Being biracial paints a blurred line that is equal parts staggering and illuminating. L as cited in the sun 2018 so it's all mixed up it's all all mixed up but the fact that you know articles like the straight out of compton you know the things where kate would do something she was praised for megan does something you know about the salads about the 18 dollar salads that she's eating about avocados you know about holding her baby bump those are those microaggression things and they've been going on for seven years every day every day constantly every single day i mean you, you you really don't need much more proof that the media the media needs some reforming when they have been hounding this woman every day for basically seven years it's unimaginable and it's racist so looking at the next article um now, this is called One Reason That Megan Suffered Racist UK Coverage. The media is not diverse. So, um, you know what? Honestly, I didn't read much through this, but it mentions the Straight Outta Compton article. It mentions uh, the, the um, meeting that, the, well, the interview that Megan and Harry had with Opal Renfrey where they dropped a bunch of bombshells, as people have, have called them, but... To me, it really wasn't bombshells. It really wasn't surprising. And I think to many women of color, it wasn't surprising because we have had to face things like that our whole life. Um, Megan just had the unfortunate circumstance of never experiencing anything like this until she moved to the UK. If that's also another, not another reason for us to know that the media needs to be reformed in the UK, I don't know what is. Um, here it shows two articles with the Daily Mail and the Sun paired up against each other. Megan flees to Canada. Meg's mugged us off. You know, it's it's crass. It's crass. And it's it's sad because they're using this poor woman basically to um make money. They're using this poor woman to basically make money. They're using hate and inciting hate against other people to make money. And um, it also speaks of white newsrooms. You know, it says that 2016 found that just 6% of journalists across UK newsrooms don't identify as white, compared about with the 13% of the general population. So that means that the newsroom does not reflect the general population. And if it's hooey if you're going to tell me, oh, they just, they just hire who's good. Um, yeah, yeah, we basically get the gist of this, you know, that that's that question of how can, um, the news, the media report in a way that is less biased and more reflective of the public of a country when the media itself, the staff of the media itself doesn't reflect a multicultural landscape. So moving on, um. So this one is called Bias, Bullshit, and Lies, Audience Perspectives on Low Trust in Media. Okay, so um, I'm only going to read a short portion from this because this study actually looks at a few different countries. It looks at the U.S., the U.K., um, I believe, yeah, Germany, Denmark, France, and Australia. So it's not hyper focused on the UK and so we'll have to sort of um, deduct what we can from that but I do think it pulls up an interesting um, point of, of observing that less people trust the media these days 
And it's bizarre because you would look at the trolls online who are defending the royal family and trashing Harry and Meghan, thinking that that is, you know, upholding their ideals. But you know, you know, that they're clearly just parroting some propaganda that they received for very, for very, that, that they received through the media for very strategic reasons. Um, but this also shows on the other hand of that, people are losing trust. So I think that this, the way that the UK media is being run right now is really on its last legs. And I'm going to get into exactly what that is in just a second. Rupert Murdoch gets thrown around a lot. And when I was doing this research, it really became so clear to me. So we're going to get into that in a second. But um, I think that it is so polarized right now, similar to the way that MAGA is polarized in the U.S. right now. It's because it's about to fizzle out, you know. It's like it's, it's on its last legs and people are just kind of going crazy before somebody just calms them down. Which, speaking of MAGA, you know, I was thinking the other day, these people who stormed the Capitol, you know, they, they made it seem like they weren't, it, it wasn't a full-blown insurrection. They, they made it seem like they were doing a peaceful protest there. I think of, you know, the, the, the march on Washington with Dr. Martin Luther King and seeing those images from a very young age of black people being washed away with those gigantic um, hoses, you know, the hoses from the fire department and, you know, the police sticking the dogs on them. Those people were actually peaceful. Those people were actually peaceful. But the insurrection at the Capitol, you know, you can't compare the two. And those people were fighting to not have to go to the back of the bus or be on black buses only or, you know, have white and black only restaurants or not be allowed to go to the same schools. And what were these people fighting for? To get Nancy Pelosi out? Because... The media had, the well, the far-right media had propaganda Nancy Pelosi to that point. You know, I feel like right now all of the lawsuits that Donald Trump is facing, that Fox News could be facing, I, you know, I feel like this really is that point of where things are really going kind of crazy because it's, it's about to fizzle out. People's, their common sense is, is trying to kick in. But this study basically says, um, in many countries, particularly the U.S. and the U.K., some media outlets are seen as taking sides, encouraging an increasing polarized set of opinions. Others are criticized for not calling out lies, keeping information back, or creating a false equivalence of partisan opinions that are obscuring facts and understanding. Now hold on to that creating a false equivalence of partisan opinions, because, um, in a second, we're going to observe how the UK media right now is really, really not partisan, not uh, nonpartisan. It's it's really dipping its its foot into a lot of political dubiousness that um, a lot of people have started to question. So, uh, for those who do not trust the news media, forty percent across the nine markets sub surveyed. So. Um, a significant proportion feel journalists do a good job in checking sources, verifying facts, and providing evidence to back up claims. So that's for... Okay, guys. So let's take a look at this a little bit more in depth. Now, um, so the other thing from this uh, Rudders Institute study that I thought was interesting it says social media, 24%, is trusted less than the news media in its ability to separate facts from fiction. Now, again, we just have seen Meghan Markle and the hate, the smear campaign that the UK media enacted towards her get into the hand of the public, the hands of the public through social media and explode even further, you know, explode even further into this level of obsession, of absurdity, of lies. Um, so it's very interesting to see that. And it also talks about the algorithms in here a bit. And we've talked about on this channel that, again, algorithms don't have a soul. They don't have morals. They don't have a moral compass. Um, it's, it's just a bunch of people and the content that drives interest, you know? And so a lot of these media companies have, um, a lot of the, the, the ones that are being really nasty towards Meghan Markle, they basically synthesize their way into social media as well, you know? And so that incites even more hate. 
And it goes on it's to say, and this is the last point we'll go through on this one. It says, despite this, we also find a substantial minority who trust social media for its broad range of views and authenticity. Some of these are people who distrust the mainstream media or complain about its biases and agendas. Now, these are the people who I feel like are really, really sort of the dangerous subset of those who have migrated away from the trashy UK tabloid media. And they are actually trusting the fake news that they see on social media because they think that the actual news sources are biased. So it's like, they are right in one way, but then they go totally wrong. You know, I almost sometimes um, when I'm talking back and forth with trolls, you know, I, I, I get the sense that these are older people sometimes. Sometimes I really just from the way that they talk, the way that they form their sentences, I get the sense that they are older conservative individuals and maybe that is the case. Maybe they've lost some trust in the Daily Mails, the Daily Expresses, you know, which at a, at a point in time in the UK, I feel like people used to really purchase those newspapers. And now they started to synthesize themselves into social media and things like that. And I feel like an older generation of Brits are probably not trusting those sources, while at the same time, they've become acclimated to using social media and they are not really going towards the ethical sources on social media either. So I think all in all, education is really an important thing and awareness. You know, I feel like the UK knows something is wrong with their media and that it needs to be reformed, but they can't really put their finger on exactly what needs to be done around it or how it needs to be approached. Like I said, I feel like we're really at that moment of just craziness before it gets before it fizzles out so next this is something that i found super duper cool so if you guys want to check this out this is called mediareform.org.uk and it's called the mrc or media reform coalition and you go on their web page and it says our media is broken okay exactly what we're talking about here and again, you know, I feel so weird talking about this of a country that's not mine, but seeing someone from my country go to another country and have their media attack her, not really for any faults of her own, but because of the broken, the broken nature of that country's media um, industry is really, really sad to watch. And something has to be done about it, you know, like I'm an American. And so stuff like this is not new for me. You know, I'm a black American and a woman. So the stuff is definitely not new for me. You know, nobody is going to take up that cross unless you do it yourself, you know. And so um, if there are any, any British people out there, Commonwealth people out there, and you're watching this and this resonates with some part of you, please maybe reach out to this media reform, sign up for their newsletter, sign petitions, see what you can do because the, the real magic will happen in making the UK media less corrupt, that UK media that has abused Meghan Markle and Prince Harry for seven years, it's going to be through policy. It's going to be through parliament and it's not going to be through um, you know, it's not going to just be through endless complaining. Some action has to be taken and protests are great, but they protests do not show up, um, you know, as a written request, as something that is an actionable item, you know, and on the desk of parliament members. And so you really, really have to approach this from a level of law. So this this is definitely one of those grassroots movements that's popping up. And in a minute, we're going to get to an article that basically talks about, um, you know, why why the UK media is corrupt. Well, a few articles, actually, it really, really enlightened me. And then um, I'm going to talk about the U.S.'s uh, media reform because the U.S. actually hit several media reforms kind of like this, kind of like where the media was just kind of going crazy in this frenzy uh, and, and publishers were just really, really making up their own rules as they went. And in the 30s and the 40s, the U.S. kind of had a media reform movement, and then again in the 80s, and then again in the 2000s. So like I said, this is not anything new for the U.S., and I really feel like the U.K. can kind of follow suit and, and, and take some notes on this because 
Um, and that's not coming. I know that the UK really has a problem with, you know, feeling like the US is always trying to mansplain stuff to them or something, but it's not about that. It's really about people of different faiths, different cultures, different races, really feeling like they have a say, uh, really feeling like your publications are coming from an ethical and moral place. This whole thing that happened with Meghan Markle should have never happened. And that is why the media needs to be reformed. So anyway, um, it goes on to say, be a part of the movement to fix it. Welcome to the Media Reform Coalition, leading the fight for media fit for the 21st century. Right there, it says it all. You know, this should not, this type of media coverage, these smear campaigns, these hate campaigns should not be happening in the 21st century. It goes on to say, the UK media, the UK's media is struggling to do its job. At a time of pandemics, climate catastrophe, and threats to democracy, we urgently need a media that can be a part of the solutions, a system that can take sense of these crises and hold the powerful to account. And we're going to get into in a second into what that powerful means. They're, they're kind of, um, they, they know that they're talking to an audience who's probably a bit more informed, but they don't go directly into it. But we're going to get into what those powers are in just a second. Instead, most of our media is part of the problem. The Media Reform Coalition brings together activists, academics, and media producers to challenge accountable media corporation, unaccountable media corporations and build an independent democratic media system. Through research, lobbying, and campaigning, we are leading the fight for media fit for the 21st century. Now, again, recognize that they they absolutely put lobbying in there. They didn't just say research. They didn't just say campaigning. They said lobbying. Now, having been a part of you know the legislative world in the U.S., um, working for a nonprofit, working on Obama's campaign. Again, that really is where the magic happens. Even me living in France, I technically don't have the right to vote, not until I have full citizenship. And that won't be at least probably for another five years. So, but what I can do is I can write to men, members of the, the ministerial cabinet. That's one thing that I can do. I can write to councilmen in France and it makes it makes actionable change. Signing petitions, um, really getting policies that you want reformed in front of lawmakers, that's really going to make the change. Not just research, not just protesting, but lobbying. Um, it says join the movement to transform the media. Um, it's got a donate down button, but you can also find a bunch of information and you can contact them. And I'm pretty sure they probably have certain, you know, forums and events and Facebook groups and things that you can join as well. So um, it says 90% of daily newspapers are controlled by just three companies. Boom. So you're getting into it right there, but we're going to go, we're going to delve deeper into that. The BBC and Channel 4 face government interference, funding cuts and privatization. You got it again. But we're going to get into that more. 70% of the people in the UK do not trust the media to be objective and nonpartisan. Now, we saw that on that study just before based across nine countries, and it said 40%. But here is saying 70% of the people in the UK do not trust the media to be objective and nonpartisan. Now, again, statistics, you know, there's no source of these statistics here. Um, and sometimes it can change. We don't know what year these are from. We don't know what the sample size is, but you can still get a clear vision that something is amiss. It's not right. And that's not just in the UK. It's in other countries as well. It's in France. It's in the US. It's in Germany. Um, it's in Australia. It's in the Western world. I mean, it makes sense. It makes sense. And that's why these questions of media reform, just like with the US having media reforms in the 30s, in the 40s, in the 80s, in the 2010s, you know, it's like it's not a conversation that ever just stops. It has to continue to be done to make sure that media is ethical. And Meghan Markle, her treatment is a direct um, proof of this. So this next one is uh, an article from Byline Times. It says Britain needs reform, uh, needs media reform now. And this was just two months ago in 2023. So, um, and it starts off with saying it's not just Harry and Meghan. 
We are all paying the price for dysfunctional, corrupted, established media. Ow, I didn't even read that before. Opposition politicians must take actions, writes Brian Cathcart. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian Cathcart. You are right. Um, so let's read through this a little bit. So it says Britain is in a terrible and worsening mess, and it can never really change for the better. That is to say that no politician or party, no matter how well intentioned, will be able to set it firmly on the path to recovery without media reform. Same thing, guys, that media needs to be reformed. That doesn't mean tinkering at the edges. It means wide ranging measures that go to the heart of the problem and can make a serious difference. Okay. Okay, Brian Cathar, he's going right in. So, um, led by a handful of national newspapers owned by people too rich to pay their taxes, they played a leading role in driving the UK out of the European Union on the basis of lies and have since helped deliver a sequence of catastrophic governments that have brought shame and ruin on the country. Ooh, guys, we know we've said on this channel before that Brexit was definitely a piece of propaganda. It was pushed so hard by the media outlets, by the politicians in power, not necessarily because it was better for all uh, British people, because it really served a certain segment of very, very wealthy British people. And this this writer is talking directly about it. And he's talking, I mean... Media at the core, ethical media, is supposed to be not as non-biased as possible. You know, it's not supposed to um, take sides on politics, really. Not unless it is really, really a, um, a publication that is either geared towards far right or geared towards far left, okay? Or geared towards left or geared towards right. You know, we can understand where they really take a side, but media publications that are supposed to be journalists journalists are supposed to be non-biased and that is not what we're seeing we know it's not so brian goes on to say it is thanks to the false cruel scroungers agenda propagated by these papers that we can't have a humane welfare system now he's talking directly about the shot that the nhs has taken through the propaganda that's been pushed through the UK media. So it's not just been Harry and Meghan who have received all of this. He's right. The entire country has suffered from this. Thanks to them, the, that governments can get away with destroying by stealth the national treasure that is the NHS. Thanks to them that our teachers are underpaid and our education system is increasing, is creasing, is is creaking, I'm sorry, it is creaking at the seams. Thanks to them that ministers are able to treat desperate refugees as criminals. And thanks to them, we have a tax system that enriches the rich. <laughs> so, um, yes. Okay, so basically, he goes into, I think, five reasons, five reasons that the media needs to be um, reformed now. So I won't go into every single one, but it says that um, one in party political influence over the BBC, and it basically talks about how um, okay, so it says, so long as the BBC is funded by the public, it must continue to be democratically accountable. But that can be achieved without letting ministers pack its management with cronies. Now, you guys remember that day that, um, you know, uh, Queen Camilla was meeting with um, Jeremy. Oh, gosh. Um, why is his last name? Uh, his last name is slipping for me. Um, the guy who wrote that, that vile stuff that he said he was referencing, uh, Game of Thrones. Um, you, we remember her meeting with him, with Piers Morgan, you know, like it's, it's kind of like that the BBC, which is publicly funded. So it's almost supposed to be like the British version of PBS. You know, it's, it's not supposed to be so entrenched in politics, and yet it really, really is. And it's coming from the higher levels. You know, they're bumping elbows with, quote unquote, the right people. And Brian is essentially calling that out. 
Equally, measures should be take uh, should be put in place to ensure that the periodic BBC charter renewals require cross party consensus, and so cannot be used to advance partisan political objectives. Okay, going right into it. You know, like um, the media can't be so inter interweaved within such partisan relationships and such partisan important um, important issues at hand. It can't be like that. Because then how is anything ever going to be ethical? How is anything ever going to be um, agnostic and secular for the public? You know, the public is made up of so many different peoples, different ideologies, different backgrounds. You know, is the media really appealing to that? So uh, it says number two, invest in the future and in regional and local news. Number three, independent, effective press regulation. Oh, I really like this. So he says the mission of the 2011 to 12 Levinson inquiry into press ethics was to design a form of press regulation, including regulation of what news publishers disseminated online that would both uphold journalistic standards and protect members of the public from cruel and abusive treatment. Now, um, the Levinson, yes. So the Levison inquiry, I don't think I pulled that up. Um, really, really bizarre. So I had actually pulled up the Levison inquiry, but essentially, um, there's a Levison inquiry. It's just a law, a, a law of codes, basically, to um, that that holds media up to a certain standard, and that was developed back in 2011. And there was basically supposed to be another referendum on this whole thing. And it just basically got swallowed up and gobbled up and never came back to because at this point, you know, these three companies that basically own 90% of the publications in the UK were making way too much money to be ethical, to be ethical. So it was like, no, that can't happen. Um, so basically he's saying what I just said, you know, there needs to be policy, there needs to be reforms in place to make sure that journalistic standards are being upheld and, 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 and making sure that the public is being treated the way that they should be treated by not receiving, um, how do we want to say, uh, unethical or skewed information, so the number four, he says, reform of news media ownership. Um, and he basically talks very, very briefly. And that's probably, I mean, he's a journalist himself, so he probably can't talk to, he can't go directly after these people. But, um, and this is a, a for-profit um, publication. So he, he definitely can't, you know, um, you know, rock the waters too much, rock the boat too much. But he basically talks about that whole thing about, you know, three companies owning 90% of the publications, how that's, that's very problematic. There can be a monopoly like that on the media. And then he again talks about that legacy, that the, the legacy of the Levison inquiry, which I, I already basically explained. So, um, I think that this is really, really important. He brings up everything, but in my conclusion, I'm basically going to get to the point that I think we can just start at one place. And you probably know what that place already is, but see what you can, if you can guess. The next one comes from Morning Star, which um, you know what I, I I don't know. I thought I thought that Morning Star was one of the ones like Daily Mail, but maybe I was wrong. Maybe Morning Star. Maybe it's the fact that Morningstar, I think, is also owned by uh, Rupert Murdoch, but it actually is one of the more left-wing ones, quote-unquote left-wing ones. But I don't know. I don't know. But I was surprised that this art article was basically hitting where I was feeling things are at um, because I'm pretty certain this publication is owned by Rupert Murdoch, but, but, but most of them are. So, you know, it's okay. Well, it's not okay, but, you know, it is what it is. We, we know the truth. So um, this article is... Uh, by Granville Williams, and it is reform of Britain's distorted media is one of the most urgent questions today. Let's start talking about it, okay? And we see a bunch of newspapers spread out, of course, with the crazy vitriol that they put out every single day. 
It says the press is free when it does not depend on the power of government or the power of money. And they've got a nice little quote from Albert Camus up here. It says the slogan, the freedom of the press, is ritually rolled out when attempts are made to challenge vicious bias attack journalism. Attack journalism is exactly right. Attack journalism is what Harry and Meghan have been experiencing and it's what trolls have taken and they've continued this conversation of hate online. So it says the charge against most British national newspapers is that they promote division through racism. Oh, they're, they're going head on the racism, political bias or sensational distortion. So something that I noticed here really seems like the UK. It just, um, I'm not really sure. It seems like they really, um, almost enjoy the fact that, um, not enjoy it seems like they see that the more outlandish that their headlines are the more uh attention that they're gonna get and i feel like this is coming from probably the days of the great depression this is probably coming from um the 1930s like from that time and they have basically tried to continue on with a modern version of that but the point is, is that these companies have way more money than they would have had in the 1930s they're producing a whole lot more news and so they have to keep one-upping themselves. It's like it comes to a point where you have to say, guys, maybe it's time we just stop now. Okay? Maybe it's time we just stopped. Um, so, yeah, it, it goes on to talk about Rupert Murdoch. Uh, this, is imp this is really, really interesting. It says, Boris Johnson met Murdoch twice in his first year as Tory party leader. And the second time, 72 hours after the general election result was announced. So again, talking about how interweaved the media and the people who own the media is with politicians. You know, it, it's there's got to be some efficacy to this. You know, there's got to be some some level of um, bipartisan bipartisanism. Like it's it's just bizarre. Um. So anti-labor coverage, it talks about how um, the Labor Party basically wasn't really getting coverage. Um, and that stemmed from the 1960s, 1970s. Um, this is a really good article. It also talks about Blair and Murdoch. This was the one place where, you know, if it seems like people really like to trash on Tony Blair um, in the UK. And... Um, you know what? I feel like the U.S. is over George Bush. I, I feel like the U.S. understands that George Bush did what he thought was best at that time. And it's like we've moved on. We've forgiven him. <laughs> it's OK. You can forgive and forget. Well, you, you don't have to forget, but you can forgive. I feel like the U.K. really hasn't forgiven Tony Blair. And it's really, really bizarre because I feel like he has a lot of things to contribute. I feel like he has a lot of valuable experience and um, he has done a lot of research on this. Same thing with George Bush, you know, just because the guy made a few bad decisions, um, some of his other accomplishments get over overshadowed. The, the fact that George Bush and Michelle Obama have a really, really cool friendship kind of speaks to this fact that um, the man wasn't all bad. He wasn't all bad. He made some bad decisions, but, um, a lot of the things that are in place in the U S day are thanks to George Bush, as well as some things that are thanks to Clinton that are thanks to Obama. Okay. It's like, guys, it happens. So, um, but yeah, I, I feel like in general, the weight of the UK, just their level of criticism is very, very, very high. It's like, guys, at the end of the day, these are human beings. They're also human beings, especially politicians. They're definitely flawed human beings and human beings make mistakes. So this is the one I think that gets into it the most. Definitely go and check out this article. Britain's media monopoly is a threat to democracy. So it says Britain's media is owned by a tiny handful of corporations with three companies controlling 90% of newspaper circulation. If we want a real democracy, it's time to break the power of the media moguls. 
It goes on to say the COVID-19 pandemic has laid bare the serious challenges facing British media institutions. Traditional broadcasters are locked in fierce competition with global streaming services and the BBC between attacks on its independence, cuts into its services and threats to its funding faces a political reckoning. The pandemic has intensified concerns about the role of social media platforms in spreading misinformation and fostering online abuse, while the anti-woke, anti-metropolitan GB News and Rupert Murdoch's News UK look tailor-made to further polarize audiences when they launch later this year. So, yeah, this article really, really hit it home. And, um... Okay, so here it is. This puts it really, really, really clear for you guys. So it says, take the, UK new, the UK's newspaper industry. In a national market of 20 daily and Sunday newspaper titles, just three companies control 90% of the newspaper circulation. Three companies. Lord Rothermeyers, Lord Rothermeyers, I'm sorry if I'm saying that name wrong, DMG Media, publishers of the Daily Mail, the Mail on Sunday, and the Metro, and the I accounts for 40% of all national newspapers sold each week in the UK, while Rupert Murdoch's News UK and Reach, which publishes the Mirror and Express titles, command one third and one fifth of the market, respectively. You know, and I don't remember if it was this article, but basically, you know, one of them said, you know, we need to take this out of the hands of some guy who it really, for better or worse, doesn't really have much to do with this country at all. I mean, Rupert Murdoch is not even British, and he is clearly someone who makes decisions based out of wanting to gain more power, wanting to gain more money, and not out of the public interest. So the fact that these people are inciting hate towards Harry and Meghan, basically based off of Rupert Murdoch and his cronies, um, and the other two, the owners who who own the majority hold of... Um, so those these three companies, News Quest, Reach, and JPI Media. You know, it's like... I guess I, I just I guess they the, the irony is lost on them that they are literally um, you know facing economic adversity struggle and should be focusing on you know their local politics creating petitions around media reform um, so that this this corrupt media doesn't affect huge important political decisions. Instead of sending hate to Meghan Markle all day, it's like they haven't gotten the fact yet that they were used. They were used. Um, so, yeah, that that's interesting. Now, on the broadcasting reform in the United States. So something that I thought was really, really interesting here, just from pulled very quickly from the Wikipedia page. Broadcasting reform in the United States has a long history beginning in the 1930s. During the 1940s, discontent with commercial media, especially radio, was widespread in the United States with the chief complaints centering on media monopolies, advertising, and lack of local accountability. Advanced by the contemporary civil rights and anti-war movements, broadcasting reform efforts of the 1960s were undertaken by various organizations at the local and national level, including the American Council for Better Broadcasts, ACBB, Action for Children's Television, a uh, ACT or ACT, Citizens Communication Center, CCC, and National Citizens, Na National Citizens Community Committee for Broadcasting, NCBB, and the Office of Communications of the United Church of Christ, the UCC. Um, and then it also goes on to talk about, okay, so this wasn't here in the Wikipedia page. This was also talked about the U.S. media um, reform movement going forward. So this is the one where they also talk about, I believe, the 80s, sort of the Reagan era. Uh, it says, we hit rock bottom with Reagan years and the advent of full throttle neoliberalism 
in the 1980s, communications was an area Wall Street and the political right had zeroed in on as being Exhibit A in their campaign to have corporate interests flower and the notion of public interest become eviscerated. See right there, you know, in the 1980s while Reagan was in office, essentially the same thing that's happening in the UK was happening in the US, you know, um, news news um, and, and media outlets that were supposed to sort of be coming from an, an, a, a non-biased place were really, really dipping their toes directly into political waters. And that's where you really get into stuff that's that comes out to be unethical, that comes out to be biased, and you get into trouble. So um, it says that the overwhelming bipartisan support of the passage of the 1996 Telecommunications Acts, regarded as the Magna Carta for communication corporations at the time, was the logical culmination of this process. So again, there, there was policy. You know, p people in the U.S., I think, have understood for a while that, um, you know, um, protesting really can evoke change, but the real business happens with policy. You, you People in the U.K., you have power. Um, and you guys need to realize that as well. You have power to effectuate good change by just really engaging in, you know, getting things, getting those policies that are better for the public, everyone at hand, not just yourself, in front of your members of parliament. So that's basically all that I wanted to say with that. Um, it also says, so it was during the late 1980s and especially in the 1990s, a grassroots media reform movement was born. It was signified by groups like the Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting or the FAIR or FAIR and the two media and democracy conferences organized by Don Hayes in 1996 and 1997. So just like, um, uh, what was it called? The, the, the media reform coalition, the MRC, you know, that's how this, this change will be effectuated is by people, everyday people. You don't have to be extremely experienced in politics. You don't have to be extremely experienced in, um, you know, legislation or a parliament or whatever that might be. You just need to kind of want to be able to effectuate change for yourself. That's going to affect you and your, um, constituents, your comrades, um, economically because what you, at the end of the day that's what you want you want what's better for the uk economically and ethically um so yeah there's this one last article uh that i share how how can the how can the public affect real change in parliament um and it basically says what i just said you you can you can sign petitions so there's lots of different ways that you can sign petitions. There's organizations like the one that I showed. Um, there's lots of different organizations. Protesting is great, but you have to try your very best to get stuff in front of your members of parliament. And um, yeah, uh, there's also this Pew Research article that talks about the key ways that the U.S. has changed. Um, it talks about basically how the media, uh, you know, those those kind of grassroots movements that stemmed up in the in the in America in the 1930s, the 1980s and 1990s to make and reform media to be more fair. Um, basically, Americans have tried and are continuing to try to synthesize that same um, cause into social media because social media is the new way that we basically digest or we consume media so i think that the uk should do the exact same thing so in conclusion taking from all of that you know what Meghan markle has received the hate the smear campaigns the racism um the sort of uh role that she has played as a distraction from political uh propaganda that 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 has that has backfired on Britain um, for seven years is really, really the proof point that media needs to be reformed in the UK. And there is really normal, everyday, simple ways that this can be done. Um, it needs to be done by effectuating change and communicating with members of parliament, by passing the right laws, and also by starting up grassroots media reform um, organizations that dip into research, that dip into lobbying, that dip into campaigning, just like um, the MRC said. And I think that 
there's a lot of different ways that this can be approached. You know, going back to that article by Brian Cathcart from Byline, you know, in party political influence over the BBC, invest in future in regional and local news, um, independent effective press regulation, reform of news media ownership, and Levison 2. Those are all great, but that is a lot to do at once. Once you do start learning about policy, you realize that um, you're much better off making a focus on one thing at a time and then moving on to the next thing when you can. Now, you can focus on a lot of little things at once, but in terms of trying to get quantity, you got to start at one place. And I think where that should start for the UK is taking the monopoly out of the media, okay? Like all of the media outlets being owned by three companies is it just that is not going to work. It's not going to work. So, um yes, grassroots organizations and lobbying for more fair policies around media and and um it's it's ethical communication with the public. And, and bi- non-biased communication with the public is a priority, you know. Um, but I think the first priority is taking the monopoly out of it, you know. Making it a representative of all those perspectives in the UK. Of the Labour perspective, the Lib Dem perspective, the Tory perspective, the white perspective, the black perspective, the Asian perspective, the Hispanic perspective, the Eastern European perspective the Middle Eastern perspective, the African perspective. So that's where I'm going to leave it, guys. I'll see you in the next video.